They're not as bad right now as they were maybe just about a half hour, hour ago. We're down about 360 points for the Dow Industrials. We we're down close to 400 at one point during the lows of the day so far. 2% move. If we get back towards that minus 390, minus 400 area, worst day since November of 2011. Neither rain, nor snow, nor sleet, nor hail, nor the incessant need to convince America that they cannot live without those who toil in the dark and dank dungeons of lower Manhattan, among other places. Wall Street was indeed working this day, and that means those slices of insight one cannot live without, including excuses. Uh, we thus turn to the chairman of the Society to Advance Financial Education. Steve Beeman joins us on the show. Steve, good to see you again, and I, I trust where you are, Chicago, Illinois, that certainly you're looking at the Northeast right now and kind of sticking your tongue out going, see, now you know what it's like. I am indeed. We had a little bit of snow, but for Chicagoans like me, you know what? This is nothing. I feel sorry for you guys and for the travelers at LaGuardia. Uh, I would never walk into LaGuardia again. I've already decided that that is, as, that is 10 times worse than a third world country. I wouldn't fly through LaGuardia actually with, with a gun to my head. But that's another story altogether. <laughs> Horrible airport. Okay. Let, let, let's get down to the realism here. Uh, the soundbite we just saw coming in talked about the stock market being down about 300 points. I'm looking right now. It's down about 230 points. Isn't it almost a little bit of an excuse, Steve? I heard people going, my God, we're plummeting. We're all going to perish here. It's going to be down 500 points. But it seems like it's an excuse almost for today. And you and I have talked so often about the first rule of investing is never panic. <laughs> and what you get on market moves like this of 1% or 2% up or down are people starting to panic and go, oh, my gosh, the sky is falling or it's always going to be good. And the reality is markets come down, markets go up. You want to keep your investment process the same regardless. And you want to act objectively and look at the reality of the positions you have and how they've changed, not just this, you know, these trading moves in the markets. And let's put this in perspective again. 200 130 points down on the Dow right now is 1.3 percent. We are not talking about a disaster here by any means. You would probably have to get down 700, 800, over a thousand points really for it to be a disaster. How's that? How am I doing so far? Fair? Well, I think you're fair and I think you bring up a really important point in that most people don't understand relative numbers. So they see a 300 point drop and say, oh my gosh, when in fact it's a small percentage of a Dow at 17,000. It's not like when it was at 1,000 many years ago, and that would have been a 30% drop. This is a small drop. So assets are down about 1%. They'll come back as the economy continues to dynamically move forward. Uh, which will continue. All right, let's talk about a couple of pieces of news here right now. I found this rather interesting. Uh, new data from the Commerce Department. The U.S. durable goods fell for a fourth straight month in December. This means it's basically a gauge of U.S. business investment plans. So how does this all then work out in the big picture? That is considered a leading indicator, and we were a little surprised. The actual consensus was for a positive move in December, when in fact we came in negative about 60 basis points or six tenths of a percent. The fact of the matter is manufacturing and business is a little bit slowing. As you and I've talked, the consumer economy was good through the uh, fourth quarter, but it tended to taper off in de December with a lot of returns back on what was originally spent. What this indicates is that the core business climate is still not that strong. Yes, we're recovering. Yes, job growth is there. But it's not the robust kind of recovery that you and I would like to see. But does it tell us when you look at it that it basically is uh, there's slowing growth around the globe right now in so many different countries. The crude oil prices are falling that while this happens and while it, it signals a weaker business spending, it, it really doesn't put up a big red light for the overall American consumer, though, does it? Not at all. It doesn't. But what you've got, again, to your point, you've got three big themes going on around the world. A rising dollar, which makes our exports more expensive, turmoil in Europe, and that's being caused partly by a slowdown in oil prices. And then you've got the economic malaise in Europe and the slowdown in China. You put those three things together, it's no wonder that we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown in these leading indicators. Got about 45 seconds before we take a break. Microsoft's struggling uh, a little bit. Their profit is falling. They have a brand new operating system out. I get the feeling Microsoft is not that automatic make big money every time they say something anymore. There's not, and I would suggest you've got two themes in Microsoft today. Number one, we're right back to that strong dollar that makes their exports more expensive. But secondly, they're being caught up in what I've referred to as disruptive technologies, which take the power out of the PC and put it into the cloud, for example. As that migrates through PCs into the next evolution, Microsoft may not be the leader in that technology, but other new, faster-moving companies will capture that. And people like Microsoft have to be certain they don't get caught in the PC sales, and there's a vacuum there all of a sudden, if and when the bottom drops out eventually, right? 
That's exactly right. And I'm sure their engineers are working hard to build better cloud computing, better smart terminals that take the power of the PC and change it a little bit. But these dynamic new technologies are going to hit Microsoft, Apple, and everybody else. Don't worry about it, Steve. They're going to put a chip in our head any day now, and it'll all be over from that point. Uh, we know that. What we also know is Steve's going to hang out in Chicago, Illinois, for a couple of minutes. We're going to return for another go at the financial wheel right after the break here on Midpoint, where every day we question everything. All right, welcome back, Chairman of the Society to Advance Financial Education. Steve Beeman joins us today as we look at what's cooking around the markets. We talked about Microsoft a couple of moments ago. Here, Steve, here's Caterpillar now, and Caterpillar is down. Now, I know that for most people this will mean, okay, big deal. This is big toys, big boys, earth-moving <laughs> equipment. But this is a major U.S. company here. And to see that them take a little bit of a dive here, what does it tell us overall about America and certainly uh, the world itself and, and what Caterpillar means as far as America is concerned? Well, and this is another one of the outcomes of this low oil price scenario as the minerals producers around the country slow down production a little bit it slows down caterpillar and that is a bellwether certainly for the midwestern economy where heavy manufacturing is down to a smaller percent in the u.s than it's ever been and so when a few of these companies like caterpillar experience problems it resonates through manufacturing so i i think it's a short-term thing i do believe that commodity prices will rebound a little bit but um, as oil goes down, you know, this is one of the negatives. And you and I have talked about that double-edged sword many times. Here's another negative here. Pfizer, stronger than expected quarterly results, sales of vaccines and cancer drugs. But their forecast for 2015, disappointed because of generics. And I guess, are we once again talking about the dollar? comes into here. A, a little bit the dollar, that's the same old story that we talk about. But with Pfizer, you have a number of these um, drugs coming off patent protection. And for the big pharmaceutical companies, that's a huge hit. When you can go out and buy what, you know, you pick your big pharmaceutical name, you buy their real drug versus the generic, there can be a hundredfold difference in prices. So these companies that produce these big name drugs really need that patent protection to sustain. And in fact, that's one of the issues that led into the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership partnership trade talks that are going on right now is protection of that intellectual property. Let's go ahead and talk about that now. You bring that up. This is the Asia-Pacific Trade Pact. They're talking about it in Washington right now. All right, Steve, here we go. Most of the time, what I like to do is make sure that the people who watch us, I figure that many of them know what we're talking about. Some of them don't know what we're talking about. So let's bring it down to what is, what is basic consumer ease, if you will. Why is the Asia-Pacific Trade Pact important overall for the average American? All right. What we're trying to do with this is open up Asian markets to American goods. There are specific wordings in this and regulations that promote American goods into the Asian marketplaces. This is basically a free trade agreement together with everybody, but materially China. They're not involved in this. But this is part of the Obama administration's pivot to the East, if you will. And they're trying to create this so that the American producers have more ability to put product into the Far East. Now, the counter side of that, which you're going to hear a lot of complaints about is that it's another one of these wage normalization acts where the United States has a higher wage level than most of those countries. And we're going to have to see a balancing out of that, meaning that our wages will come down and theirs will come up and meet in the middle. But aren't we still looking at a point, though, if you're talking about exporting goods and certain manufactured goods here in America, you're still talking about people who are working here. You're talking about factories that are working. You're talking about instead of producing 2 million units, you could be producing 10 million units because you're basically going to a new market, correct? You're, you're exactly right. Free trade is good for the economies overall. So I think in a net net, we have to look at free trade agreements as a positive. You and I have spoken about how this is even effective in a place like Cuba, where we can go in and ship more wheat. We can ship cons or some heavy manufacturing goods. As you go to the Far East, there's an awful lot of folks that we can bring into the middle class and ship in more food, more consumer goods. So it will be a net positive for the American business, even regardless of the possible wage issues. Will this really force China to play by global? Global rules, as some people seem to think. No, but it certainly <laughs> helps continue the battle to try to get them to play by global rules. China kind of runs China's own thing. It's a huge economy. They know where they stand, so they're not quick to give in to American agreements. But I think this does continue to push the world toward a more free trade thing. Coming off the Davos meeting in Switzerland last week, 
free trade is certainly a big part of the economic agenda globally. Suddenly we have made all kinds of sense of what's going on here. People now understand completely what's happening and why. That's because they don't read the wonks. They listen to us instead, which makes it a whole lot easier. Reminder again, the Society to Advance Financial Education. Look it up. Steve does a great job here talking to us about it. He really educates people about finances and society and the economy. That's why we have them here. Steve, always a pleasure, my friend. Have a great day. Enjoy what little snow you have. And I will, and I don't even know how to respond to that. Thank you very much. Okay. Come on. It's because you're the best there is at what you do, my friend. That's why we have you here. All right, Steve, take care. The reality of a terror cell here in America and what comprises a threat. That is next here on Midpoint.